you all. Today, we are going to be worshiping the Lord and hearing a message from Him. But before we begin anything, I want to welcome all of you who are watching and connecting with us through Facebook Live. This is the Church of God, New Life Tabernacle. This is your pastor, Juan Vasquez. Thank you so much for joining. And today, as we get into today's service, I want to just ask that you would put away anything that might be a distraction so that you could give your full attention to the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness, your mercies that are made you every single morning, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you would take complete control of today's service, of the atmosphere that is around us. I pray, Lord, that if anyone is going through any situation, that today's worship and today's message would bring encouragement and hope to them, that it would challenge them also to draw closer to you. I pray if there's any be, be anybody who is lost, that they would also be able to come to Christ this day through this message. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, today we're going to be worshiping the Lord. And we're going to continue doing what we're doing. Uh, but first, let us have a moment of worship.
hopeless have found their hope. The orphans now have a home. All that was lost has found its place in you. You lift our strong instead you took these rags and made us beautiful for all that you've done we will pour out our love this will be our anthem song Jesus we
I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Thank you, Jesus. Stop till I'm found. It's your love. Your love pursues me. It finds me. It never lets me go. Cause your love is never ending. It's overwhelming. Oh, it's your love, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, God, for your love, your reckless love. You are amazing. Isn't God good? He is awesome, and his love is overwhelming. That was the worship for today, and I would like now, if you can just spare me a few minutes to be able to bring to you the message that God placed in my heart. And today, I want to start off by mentioning this. Uh, there have been a lot of prophetic voices over the generations that have come before us and even now that have spoken about things that God will do or that God has done and they have prophesied different things. One of those things that um, prophets before us or even prophets of this generation have declared and prophesied is that this might be the generation that sees a billion soul harvest come to God 
come to salvation, come into the kingdom of God. A revival so big that a billion people from all across the world would give their lives to Jesus and populate the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't know if that prophecy is true or not, okay? Uh, and if it is true, I don't know if this is going to be the generation that is going to see that prophecy come to pass. But what I do know is that the salvation of the lost is in the heart of God. And any effort to see many souls come to Christ is something that I want to be a part of. It is my opinion that the greatest harvest of souls occur during times of revival. That is why today I want to make a call to the local church and also to anyone who wants to connect or is watching right now. I want to make a call for us to consecrate ourselves and ask the Lord to come in revival. Therefore, the title of today's message is A Call of Consecration for Revival. A Call of Consecration for Revival. And I want us to go to the book of Joel, chapter 2. And we're going to just read two verses, starting in verse 28. The word of God says, It will come about after this, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Amen. Let's pray. Father, let it be so. I join with those prophetic voices and I say, Lord, let it be so. Bring a revival so powerful, so great, Lord, that we would see a billion souls come and be swept into the kingdom. And I want to be a part of it, Lord. And may each person listening now also desire in their hearts to share in this revival this we pray in the name of jesus amen amen well i want to tell you guys um for many many years i have had a great interest in this topic of revival um, revival in america revival across the world i have read many many books and watched many documentaries on this topic of revival and this love for revival, in fact, started when a friend of mine bought for me and gifted me this book right here, God's Generals, written by Robert Liardin. And this specific one is uh, The Revivalists. And in it, Robert Liardin presents different biographies of different people who were used by God in revival. And reading those stories about how these men were used of God and the, the move of God that they experienced in their generation began to create a hunger in me for revival. But what is revival? What is revival? Well, I want to define revival in these words. And I wrote this definition in the book that I wrote, Christ Like Supernatural. Revival is like a flood breaking through a dam. Revival is when the kingdom of God breaks through this realm through a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. When God pours out his spirit in this way, the spirit brings the kingdom and releases it in our midst in a mighty way. Revival is the closest manifestation of the kingdom of God on the earth before Jesus returns. Now, I also want to read to you a definition written by Dr. Mary Stewart Ralphie, who authored or wrote this book called The Cure of All Ills. And this book is about revival. And here's how she defines revival in this book. Revival is a move of God's Holy Spirit, which changes the moral climate of a nation or of nations, sweeps multitudes into the kingdom in brief periods of time, produces phenomenal church growth, creates a powerful thrust toward godly activity, including 
an intense sympathy for the poor and the spirit of self-sacrifice as opposed to self-indulgence. It is always accompanied by a commensurate decrease in crime, drunkenness, jail, and prison population, occultic activity, illegitimate births, closures of indecent houses of entertainment, and the move continues to influence society for about a generation. Church, I don't know about you, but when I see the condition of the Church of Jesus Christ in the West and the condition of our society and the things that are taking place in our government and taking place in our nation and all around us in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our families, I believe that we need revival. In her book, Dr. Mary Stewart Ralphie, this is what she proposes about the, the, the topic or about the need for revival. She says, God has chosen only one method by which to do radical surgery upon society. Only one means by which he invades mankind's problems with supernatural solutions. And that solution is great revival. On the back cover, she says that revivals have prevented wars, stabilized society, empty jails, idled police, laid off judges, bankrupted breweries, which means bars, closed theaters, converted atheists, nearly eliminated drunkenness, crime, and gambling, restored purity to the church, virtue to government, and integrity to commerce. After hearing that and reading that, I don't know about you, but I know after hearing that, that we need revival. Church, we need revival now. We need it today, not tomorrow, but we need revival now. That is why I'm preaching this message to call the church to a time of consecration for revival. What that means for us is that there will be a time for us to take now to do fasting and repenting and prayers. So beginning this Friday, May 22nd, until Sunday, May 31st, which is the Feast of Pentecost, during those 10 days, we are going to humble ourselves before God by prayer and fasting and confessing and repenting of sin. We will not be watching any secular entertainment. We are going to pray for the salvation of souls and for the revival of the Church of Jesus Christ. I want to finish and conclude the sermon by reading a portion from another book on revival. This book was written by Eddie L. Hyatt, and he titles this portion, If My People, If My People. And look at what he says. It is of utmost importance that we realize that even though evangelical Christians helped elect a president, the awakening that will save America will not rise from a political process or party. The next great awakening will not begin at the White House, but begin at God's house. The change we so desperately need will come when Christians meet, not in Washington, D.C., but in 2 Chronicles 7.14. The promise of a national healing in 2 Chronicles 7.14 begins with the condition, if my people. Notice that God did not say, if the king or if the judges. He said, if my people. This means that America's future is in our hands. This was powerfully illustrated by an event described by Dr. Billy Brim in her book, First of All and the Awakenings. She tells how in 1979, listen to this, she and about 40 others got, had gathered to pray for the upcoming elections and for Israel. As they prayed up a storm for the approaching election, 
the Spirit of God suddenly fell on her in a way that stunned her. Words came with such power, she said, it was almost like I had to speak them or die. She found herself declaring, one thing will save America, and it is not the election. It is an awakening to God. One thing will avail for Israel and the nations. It is an awakening to God. She said these words. She said these words shook us, silenced us, even rebuked us. They suddenly realized the reality of 2 Chronicles 7.14. Unless the people of God wake up and fulfill those conditions for a national awakening and healing, it won't matter who is in the White House or on the Supreme Court. Yes, the time has come for the American church to awaken. 1 Peter 4.17 says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, Paul exhorted the Corinthian church, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, indeed, you are disqualified. Close quote. Church, we need to prepare ourselves for revival. We need to consecrate our lives to the cause of God's kingdom and to spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of salvation. But in order for us to see the greatest amount of souls come in the briefest amount of time, we need God to step down. We need God to pour out his spirit. We need God to bring in the harvest. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And 2,000 years ago, he was risen on a cross. And after being buried, he rose from the dead. And we have a message to proclaim. But for us to preach this message, we need God's power. We need God's presence. We need God's glory. And the only way that the church is going to experience this glory, the only way that the church is going to experience this power, the only way that the Holy Spirit is going to draw multitudes is when the church gets serious, when the church gives itself to prayer and to in calling on God and to invoking His name and repenting of sin and, and clean cleansing cleansing itself from all the impurity and uncleanliness that has contaminated it from this world. I don't know about you, but hearing all these things about revival stir my heart. And I know that we need it now. When I look at the condition of, of our churches here in America, here in New York, in my own life, I say, God, we need you now. God, we need revival now. Not tomorrow, but, but today. Won't you come, O oh Lord? Won't you rend the heavens, O oh God, and step down? One person defined revival as this. Revival is when God gets tired of seeing us doing what we do and decides to show up himself. That's a paraphrase when he comes and so church I call you to a time of prayer and fasting and consecration let's come together from May 22nd which is a Friday for 10 days to the 31st and let's see if what God did on the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago he can repeat again in our day father I've shared the word that you put on my heart and I just pray that these words would fall on sensitive hearts, on willing, obedient hearts. And my prayer is, God, that you would set us on fire for Christ and that we would give ourselves to you. That we would be able to say with Paul, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live 
Now I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. Lord Jesus, I present my life and those who listen, and I say, do as you will. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you next time.